this interview with us. Chris, you're an inspirational leader with vision, passion and drive, capable of motivating and energising others and with strong influence and skills. You have a record of delivery developed through ministerial, CEO, chair and director roles in the public, private and not-for-profit sectors. I can vouch for your ability to add value to complex projects, having personally worked with you on the current account switch service and at the Money Charity. We're having this interview today as part of our research activities on behalf of the Emerging Payments Association and in conjunction with the Inclusion Foundation. And I'd like to ask you three questions. Do you wear many hats, including being appointed recently as the chair of the Financial Inclusion Commission? Can you tell us a bit about the aims and goals of the Commission? Yes, the Commission was set up, Anne, in 2014 with the intention of really um, trying to promote financial inclusion across the UK. And by that, we mean making sure that people have access to the sort of products and services they need which meet their needs over the lifetime, and that they have both the skills and the confidence to make use of those products. Now, that means it comes from both directions. First of all, we need financial services, and particularly FinTech, I think, to come forward with the sort of products and services which match the way that people lead their lives today. And secondly, to uh, make sure that people feel that they are able to access those products and services. They have the skills, the confidence to, to do so. Um, and we do have a major problem of financial exclusion in the UK. Um, we've got a million people who don't even have a bank account, even though we like to pride ourselves as being a, a hub, of global hub of financial services. Um, we've got a quarter of the population who don't have access to basic insurance services, a quarter of the population who wouldn't manage for a month if suddenly they lost their, their source of income. So we have a very real problem and it's one that's been getting worse. The commission is an independent body. It's made up of parliamentarians from all the major parties together with experts um, in different aspects of financial exclusion. We meet every Friday morning at 8.30. Uh, without fail, we've done so since March. Um, and there's at least a dozen commissioners who join each of those calls. And so we are trying to raise the profile of the issue um, and make sure we, we achieve some change, even in these difficult circumstances. Speaking about the difficult circumstances, what's your view on the present economic environment and in particular access to affordable credit? Well, the current, <clears throat> current circumstances for many people, of course, are terrible. Not only the tragedy of the virus itself and the health implications, but also the economic implications, both for individual households and small firms. And we've got something like um, 14 million people who even as long ago as May, and it will be worse now, said that the pandemic had had a direct detrimental effect on their financial position. Now, the important point is that the, the effects of this um, don't fall like God's gentle rain, which I can see out of the window this morning, evenly across the population. It's striking from below. And it's affecting most those who are already vulnerable, who already are on the edge. And we know that um, a very large proportion of the population, even before the pandemic, um, were in a very precarious situation without savings, without insurance, without financial capability to be able to manage what was about to hit them back in March. And now are finding that they are in very serious circumstances. And one of the, the major difficulties is that access to affordable credit, because many people um, are turning uh, as far as they can to short term uh, credit sources to be able to make ends meet. We've seen a decline in uh, wages and real wages over a long period of time, made worse by the pandemic. We've seen many people who have furloughed or have lost their jobs altogether. And they've been turning to credit to try to fill that gap between living costs and incomes. And at the same time that the demand for that credit has increased, the supply has been curtailed. So for reasons that we would all applaud, of course, there were the restrictions on high cost short term credit, payday and others. But the difficulty was that while the supply was reduced, the um, demand wasn't reduced 
And so people have had to turn elsewhere um, to wherever they can, whether it be friends and family. In some cases, we know they've turned to the illegal lenders um, and are, are looking for uh, financial services to step forward. Now, there are things the government is doing, for instance, with Fair For All, you know, the, um, the fund for affordable credit, which is um, based on uh, the, the, using the funds from dormant bank accounts, etc. We've got things um, like uh, also <laughs> confusingly called Fair For You, which is um, an, a, 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 a social enterprise equivalent of Bright House providing people with the sort of basic goods they need, washing machines, et cetera, at affordable prices. And that's expanding um, considerably, I'm pleased to say. But we've got circumstances in which many of the lenders to which the more vulnerable would turn um, have withdrawn from the market during the pandemic. And that's partly in the case of some of the non-bank lenders because they don't have access to funds. The banks have been shored up by government, but non-bank lenders haven't. And those are the very sources of lending which people used to rely on. So we have a real, an impending crisis of affordable credit, um, which really um, legacy financial services have to step in uh, to fill that gap. And I also hope that FinTech, um, some of the new innovation will step in to provide people with alternative sources of affordable credit, as well as hopefully alternative sources of insurance and savings products and payments products, which are the most important. I think that actually really comes into the last question, which is around what can the government and the fintech industry really do to, in the short to medium term? And may, may also maybe to look further out as well, because this, this will not be a short term fix. We have to actually deal with this in a, a compassionate way. You're absolutely right, Anne. And one of the first, thinking about the government, <laughs> first of all, um, one of the first demands of the Financial Inclusion Commission, when we set it up in 2014, was that there should be a Minister for Financial Inclusion. And lo and behold, <laughs> before we knew it, not only, there's not one, there were two ministers, a bit like waiting for a bus, isn't it? And so we've got uh, Guy Opperman in Department for Work and Pensions and John Glenn in the Treasury, both of whom are, I have to say, passionate on this agenda. And uh, John Glenn in particular has got a real belief that fintech can address many of the problems of financial exclusion. And that's a belief that the Commission certainly shares, because the problem is that legacy financial services um, are designed almost as if um, people still lead their lives as they did in the 1950s. You know, that um, people have a regular and predictable source of income that's going to come in week by week and month by month, where nobody um, is operating on zero hours contracts, um, where nobody faces the uncertainty that so many people do nowadays, whereas fintech can actually be lighter on its feet, can come forward with services and products which are designed to meet the way people do lead their lives and meet their, their preferences and needs. And so I'm quite hopeful that if we can encourage um, that sort of financial innovation, we could really start to address um, those aspects of financial exclusion, which have been so difficult to shift in recent years. And I'm really pleased to say that the FinTech Delivery Panel, of which I'm a member, has set up a strand of work, um, which Monzo and myself are leading on, um, which is about how you use FinTech to address financial exclusion. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we could see real changes, particularly in the payment sphere, um, which would make a real difference to people's lives. Fantastic. I'd like to say thank you very much, um, Chris, as always, an inspirational and a fantastic discussion.